I'm Alicia Michalisic Kurtz, an emergency doctor based in California, and this is Real Talk, a place where doctors and other healthcare professionals tell stories about their human experiences working in medicine. On today's episode, we'll hear a story from Ian Butler, an emergency and critical care doctor in San Diego, California. Ian's story was recorded at a live Real Talk session in Chicago, Illinois. Have you ever been in a situation where everything, and I mean everything, pardon my French, just sucks? That little rage monster that lives inside you has broken its leash and is running amuck in your life. And then at some point, you realize that you're the only person around you that's miserable. Somebody or something helps shake you out of your negative cloud and you realize that Life is actually pretty good. It's all about how you look at it. The same situation through your Wednesday hump day eyes versus your Saturday morning on a three day weekend eyes. But both sets of eyes are your eyes. In medicine, our patients come to us looking through a specific lens. A lens shaded by their backstory, their pain, their fear and colored by so many details of their life history that led them to this exact moment. And while the time constraints we face as providers limit us from hearing that whole story, we must find a way to catch at least a glimpse into our patient's view and to stand beside them and empower them to make that view a little less bleak when we can. This is Ian's story. So I'm Ian. Uh, I was uh, an ER doctor uh, that did critical care after that, and now I practice as as an ICU doc uh, at uh, San Diego down in Palomar. I actually wanted to be a doctor since I was probably 10. My sister brought home this medical kit, and I liked it, and I started really getting into anatomy and all the little, I just wanted to be a doctor. And that lasted through, you know, I was, I was one of these cutthroat pre-med guys who would do all-nighter tests and just like really was at the top of my class, 4.0. And then one day in the, in the finals week of my sophomore year, I was really tired and I was going up some stairs and I was out of breath. And my buddy who I was studying with was a smoker and he said, I think you should start smoking. <laughs> and, I like, and, and I kind of noticed it, but I, I just put it off. And I, you know, I, maybe I'm studying too much. I don't know. I've got four more days, and I'll be done with all these tests. And I happened to see my parents, who were coming back from a vacation for dinner that week. And my mom looked at me and was just like, you need to go to a doctor pretty much tomorrow. And I went, and it turned out that I was having a bone marrow failure. I was having an aplastic anemia. My platelets were like five, my hemoglobin was five, my white cells were five, like I, I was in this, <laughs> this new club of the five, five, five. And, and I was sick, I was a really sick kid. It took about a week for us to figure this out and when we found out exactly what it was, I was transferred to Johns Hopkins and that's where I stayed for the next three months. Uh, this was in 96. So back then a bone marrow transplant was kind of a big deal. Uh, I think mortality for what I was going through was about 85%, it was really high. And as I kind of got to know these numbers, I I thought, wow, this is going to be a crazy, crazy experience. So they transferred me, and I was on the third floor of the Hopkins Oncology Unit, and this is exactly what I saw out my window. It was this parking garage, and people would come in the morning and fill it up, and throughout the day, there'd be like one or two people moving in and out. And then at the end of the day, everybody would leave, and it'd be relatively empty, and I'd see whose cars were stuck there. And I thought, there is no way I'm going to spend three months just looking (laughs) at this. Uh, And so I asked, are there any other rooms? There's got to be a room with a view or something, something other than this parking lot. And uh, and they said, well, you know, the room's down on the other side. We don't have any open right now, but, you know, people die. One's going to be available soon. In about three, four days, uh, this guy died who, you know, he was like this guy in his 50s going through, I don't know what kind of cancer, but I kind of got to see him and stuff. And... Uh, and, and they said, do you want that room now? And I said, yes, absolutely. And they moved me to this room, and, and this is what I saw. This is the city of Baltimore. This is literally the view. And it had this park in the foreground. It had uh, these buildings, and the, and the buildings were dynamic because as the sun started to go down, they would turn their lights on, but not all at the same time. And so I would get to know which building was going to turn their lights on first 
and it happened every day, the same building, and then the next one, and the next one, and then around two, three in the morning, they would all start to shut their lights down in that same order. You know, you can see the road here, there'd be a traffic jam in the morning going in and a traffic jam in the afternoon coming out. And I started to see people walking their dogs in these parks and, you know, I got to know them a little bit. I'd see this gold retriever that, you know, kind of take a dump and they'd pick it up. And <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd be like, oh, they're picking up. Hey, that guy's not picking up the, the doo-doo. I gotta report this guy. Uh, and you know this this view became for me this this source of constant entertainment, and I really loved it. And it was for me just kind of took my mind off of a lot of stuff that was going on, mainly my own mortality and chemo and the fact that I was getting ready to have this transplant. Uh, this went on for a good week, maybe two weeks. I don't know, but at some point, I started to really get sick, like really sick. Couldn't get out of bed. I was going, you know, the chemo was, was all throughout my body and, and uh, you know, maybe I was getting the bone marrow transplant soon. And at some point I closed the window and I, and I stopped looking out the window actually for several days. Uh, this thing that I had literally changed rooms to get to and now I'm not even interested in it anymore because I'm so focused on myself. And I, I didn't realize it until maybe two years later when I was talking to somebody else that it was, this was depression, right? I was actually incredibly depressed about the fact that I was so sick, which makes sense. I should have been. I was. Uh, and I stopped looking out this window because it wasn't that I wasn't interested. It was actually because I didn't like it anymore. I saw this, this dog walking out there, and I knew if that dog licked me in the face with a white count of zero, I would probably pick up an infection and die. <laughs> I looked and I saw all these people going to their jobs and their lives and I kind of knew that if I died or lived, it didn't matter. This was just gonna keep going and nobody would even notice. Uh, I saw this construction site and every time the powder of air would go, you know, dust would go up, I'd see this in the air and I'd say, wow, there's so many spores in that. that if I inhale them, I'll end up getting sick and dying. So I saw this place now that was gonna kill me and I stopped looking at it because it constantly reminded me that I was gonna die from something out there, perhaps. Somebody noticed this, and I don't know if it was a nurse that said, hey, you know, uh, you haven't looked out the window in like a week. You've had the curtains down and you moved here for this view. Like, do you, what's going on there? I was like, oh, I don't know, it's the light, the, the light's kind of bright, it hurts my eyes. And, uh, and so that was that, that was my answer. And so as this, this view goes away, I started thinking about it that night. Why am I not looking out the window? And because, you know, because I, I realized when I told her oh, the light's hurting my eyes, I was lying. I knew that. Why was it? And I, I thought about all this stuff about how I didn't like this view because it was this place of death. And I also remembered how much I loved the view when I first went there. And I started thinking about it and I thought, you know, nothing's changed outside my window. Everything that's changed has happened right here right here in my head, just my perception of it. And I didn't like that. I didn't like that I had changed this window from this wonderful thing to this painful thing, and it was still this great view. So I opened it up back up again, and there was the same buildings with the same lights turning on at the same time, the same traffic jam, and the golden retriever was still coming out, walking along. I saw the construction site, and I started to get interested into the view again. And I, I just kind of, if I had a thought about this is a place that's going to hurt me, I just suppressed that. And I thought, what did I like about this before? Now, we're about a month into this, and I'm getting back into my view, and it's becoming this source of constant, uh, not just entertainment, but also kind of comfort for me. Because no matter what happened to me that day, whether or not it was a really painful bone marrow biopsy and you know my family was there and then they would leave and you know at the visiting hours over at 10 o'clock, the only thing that was still with me was this view. And it was there every single day for the next two months. It became this actually the source of strength for me because I knew that there was constancy in my life, outside of me, there was constancy going around in this world. And if I woke up the next morning and I saw this view again, then I knew I was still here. This thing was, for me, a source of entertainment, a source of pain, a source of strength, something that really helped me with my perspective to get through this whole thing. The view never changed. It was always me. So now I actually pay attention to my patient's views. I'm really lucky. Pal Has anybody been to Palomar? We have these amazing <laughs> views, right? Uh, and, and I'll go into rooms sometimes and people will have the, the view closed 
And I'll say, hey, have you looked out there? Have you, have you seen the traffic jams, et cetera? And uh, they say no, and we'll open it back up and just kind of get into the view with them. That's my story that I want to share with you guys. In Ian's story, we're reminded that our perspective, our view from the window, while influenced by our present circumstances, is still a choice. Something we have control to change that's up to us, even when we're otherwise feeling powerless. Think about a time in your life when your view from the window was bleak. How did you change it? What do you do to help others, your patients, your loved ones, open the blinds on their life's window? How do you validate their current view for them, but help make it a little less gloomy? If you have a story that you want to share with Real Talk, or you want more information about our program, email us at realtalk at vituity.com or follow us on Instagram at real.talk.podcast. Special thanks to Ian Butler for sharing his story with us, to the team at Vituity for supporting this podcast, to Marco Gonzalez, our sound engineer, and to all of you for listening. I'm Alicia, and this is Real Talk.